you know, um, I, I planned to write like a fancy speech, and I'm like always torn on whether I should do that or just go off the cuff. And uh, today I'm going to try off the cuff at least uh, this morning. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Every time I hear my bio read, I, I can't help but wonder what 17 year old Danny, which is when I joined the army, when my mom signed me into the army, right legally. I wonder what he would think. I mean, I was. At 17, probably without understanding the term, a budding neocon. You know, I was from patriarchal racist Staten Island, the only borough in New York City that voted for Trump. Um, I really believed that the U.S. was a force for good in the world, specifically the U.S. military, and I couldn't wait to join. Now, this is before 9-11, just barely. July 2nd, 2001, when I went to West Point. I think that 17-year-old me would really like the first part of my bio, where it talks about what I did in the Army. I would really hate the second part where it mentions he's against the war now and, and you know and for a living you know fights against the war state but I'm glad that I made that change you know it's funny when we talk about the movement and Michael did such a great job talking about intersectionality and just the value of that right um, I find that when I give these speeches I'm either the youngest or the oldest person in the room and never in between okay um, when I speak at colleges I'm the oldest person in the room and I'm a dinosaur to them and I'm 36 right and I look younger uh, but when I speak to a lot of uh, peace organizations, like, like this one, and, and Veterans for Peace, I find that I'm one of the youngest, usually. And, and that's not a bad thing per se, but I really do wish that, the, and there is some in this audience, I really wish there was more youth in the movement. I think our challenge, in addition to the inter intersectionality of gender and race and, you know, all of that, is like we've got to somehow get the young behind us. I think they're with us if they could look up from their phones, and, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but I think that they're out there. You know, um, on paper, so far as the Army was concerned, I was kind of their golden boy um, for a minute. You know, I, uh, I went to West Point, then I went back and taught there, right, which is a pretty hard assignment to get. I had a slew of glowing reports, right, evaluations. They said, future general, this guy, promote him early, you know, all that. And then, uh, and then I stayed in the Army, right, for 18 years, right? And, I, and I'm embarrassed of that now, in a sense. Like, Especially because my evolving justifications, they, they don't feel so good inside now. You know, at first it was self-righteousness, like I'm doing God's work, right? Then it was, well, I don't really like what I'm seeing in Iraq, but my bosses keep telling me, the bosses that I respect, that if, if I get out, then all, all the sociopaths will be left, so people like me have to stay in. And I really like gold stars ever since kindergarten, so I stayed in. And then eventually, and then eventually it's pensions and money and all the economic problems in America today. Um, the, the scary truth, the sad truth, the uncomfortable truth is that by the time I was 23 years old and that I was in Iraq for 15 months in Baghdad at the height of the Civil War, I knew that the game was up. I knew better. And I stayed, you know, almost 13 more years. You know, dissent, especially within the military on active duty, is hard and it, it's, it's a little bit lonely. You know, the way I described it, you know, I started writing anti-war screeds, including a book that I can't believe they let me publish, um, in 2015, 2014 and 15. So I was on active duty for three years, like, yelling about the empire, right, which is kind of my theme today, and, and, and yelling about the wars, and, and you have to stop them, and, and all this, and it was like, I mean, I was a pariah suddenly. The kid who was their golden boy suddenly was a pariah. I lost friends. I was cautioned by mentors. And it really felt like being an atheist, but still living in the monastery. And it, it, was, it was a tough time. My breaking point, I think, was Afghanistan, 2011 and 12. Unlike Iraq, which I went to with high hopes and believing in the cause, I went to Afghanistan as a professional mercenary. I mean, it's really all I was. I didn't believe in the cause anymore. I was there to just try to protect as many of my guys as possible, and because it was my job. But when I got home from Afghanistan, I realized that I could no longer look a mother or a spouse in the eye and tell her that her son or her loved one died for something. I, I had nothing to tell them anymore. Sure, I could trade in the platitudes of he died for his brothers and not for his country, but I don't accept that. You know, of course we die for our brothers, but, but it, we should also be there sacrificing for more than that. It ought to be meaningful. And that was really a breaking point for me, and I sort of went off the rails and... Uh, me and the Army, after a lengthy investigation that almost took my uh, pension and benefits, decided that we should probably part course. And uh, it, was, it was one of those rare mutual breakups. People had it worse than me, um, for sure. 
you know, I would never try to act like my experience was the hardest one. I have both my legs, right? I'm here speaking to you. I have most of my mind. But, but I did do some tough tours at tough times, both surges, Iraq and Afghanistan. I was in recon units. I was a commander. I was an officer, you know. I mean, five of my soldiers were killed in combat. Three killed themselves. Over 40 were wounded, including the triple amputee and many double amputees. I mean, it was, it was hard. And oh, by the way, pretty much all my soldiers are, like, just littered with PTSD. And I was as well. Uh, to the extent that, you know, my last official duty in the Army was inpatient rehab, okay, for PTSD in Arizona. Not how I expected, you know, my career to end up. I would call it an ignominious end to a once bright career, but it was important. These are just some of my guys who uh, lost their lives. But with that, I want to jump into this topic, which is what I'm really going to get into way more depth on later, which is empire. My first and my main point is that we live in an empire, and, and I think most people in this room would agree with that, but I would say, and I think most of you would agree, that most Americans don't think that. I mean, the trick is for, for the government, and has always been, how do you hide an empire, which is a great book uh, yes. by Daniel Lee Moore, which you should check out. Um, what makes an empire? Okay, um, when we think of empire, we think of these, right? You've got the Romans here, and of course we've got the British, right? Paint the map red in, in London, but they're maritime. And, and, and in our heads, or in the, the heads of most American people, an empire can only be an empire if it's maritime. If it looks like the British Empire. If it looks like the Roman Empire. But what about these empires? I would submit that from its start, America was an empire, a settler colonial, like Israel. You can get in trouble for saying that, right? A settler colonial empire based on landward expansion from the start. And you know who else has that same model? Russians. Peas in a pod, maybe. Now, no one likes to talk about that. But our empire and Russia's empire were exactly the same. They just moved east and took away the indigenous people's land, and we went west. Same process. We met in Alaska at the Bering Strait. That's the reality. So I'm not going to go into a lot more of this, but I just want to consider a few stats to make my point. First of all, you know, we spent $5.9 trillion by a modest estimate so far on these wars. That sounds imperial. We have 800 bases in 80 countries that we know about. The rest of the world, the rest of the armies in the world have about 21, by my count. China has one. I keep hearing they're going to take over the world. They have one overseas military base as of now. We have 10 to 15 aircraft carriers. No one else has more than two. Okay? The Chinese air first aircraft carrier is a leaky Russian version left over from the Soviet <laughs> Empire. But somehow they're coming to Washington to take our kids, right? We are exceptional in our use of drone assassination. We defy sovereignty in airspace, and we don't even ask for permission, and we certainly don't ask for forgiveness. No other country is really doing that except Israel. We are at war right now in 25-plus countries. I just wrote an article about what my students are out doing. My four, I taught cadets at West Point. My last crop will graduate in May. And my nightmare, I told them, has come true, that they're going to walk the same alleys in the same paths of Iraq and Afghanistan as I did, but 25 other places they could be in danger across from West Africa to Central Asia. We bomb seven countries daily. And we apologize for our empire because we say it's not an empire because actually we're spreading democracy. Because as everyone knows, inside every Afghan, if you just unzip them, is a budding American capitalist. <laughs> and we're sold this, and an enormous portion of the population believes it. So we've been an empire from the start, settler colonial. The wars we're fighting today are largely illegal. No declarations of war. We have two AUMFs. We'll talk about a just lifeless term. Authorization for the use of military force. It's a declaration of war, okay, except it's not. They're so vague that they're used to cover all these wars, but in reality they only authorize two. The one in Afghanistan, which has gone off the rails, and the one in Iraq, which was, of course, sold to us on false pretenses. All the rest is completely unilateral, completely imperial president. As long as the country is vaguely Muslim or vaguely leftist, we have the right to step in and conduct a regime change. The question isn't whether you have an emperor. The question is, how do you like your emperor? Do you like your emperor to be sort of buffoonish and inarticulate? Well, we got a bush for you. Do you like your emperor to be polite? Well, we got you an Obama. Do you like him to be coarse and overt? Well, you got your Trump. I mean, it, it, not to say that Trump isn't worse or that Bush isn't worse than, say, Obama, but it's, these people are from the same mold, OK? 
Okay? Trump, of course, is exceptional, and we'll have to deal with that. So I'm going to breeze through, you know, the rest of, you know, these slides, and, you know, just I want to show you the basis, though, because, I mean, if you are Russia and China, the American model is that, like, they're encircling us. Like, they're coming for us. But the map, I love maps. They say pictures are worth 1,000 words, maps are worth 10,000. Looks a little different, right? If, if you're Iran, who's threatening who, right? So, but what I'm going to talk about, and I'll go into more detail on these individual places, I want to talk about what happens when the empire comes home. We are looking at a society that is irreparably, perhaps, affected by the empire. Empires always come home, always in the form of civil liberties being taken away, in the form of immigration. Look at the British Empire, right? I mean, look at the new demographics of England, and the, it looks like the people they used to essentially enslave or, or used to colonize. So the empire comes home both physically in the form of people, but then also ideologically in the form of suppression at home. This is what empires do. It's what they've always done. We have militarized police. We don't have community policing. We have occupation forces. We have police forces that look like this, Okay, they look like soldiers because they have our equipment, because the military sold their surplus off to them. Yep. So you've got towns in Indiana with a thousand people, but they have a SWAT team and MRAP, which is basically like a small tank. And what are they using it for? What's the threat? We're the threat. Okay, inevitably, the, the peace activists, the pacifists, we become the threat. Even if they don't say it's us, they say it's terrorism, but it's so easy to turn us into terrorists. And, and governments do that. Mass incarceration is also directly tied to the empire, okay? We, we imprison people of color at rates 10, 12, 14 times higher than, say, Cuba, which is like number two. Do we really want to be in that company? It, it, it's absolutely wild. And, you know, for me, it all came home in a personal sense. So, so that's Eric Garner. It's kind of hard to see the slide. Being uh, choked to death, murdered by uh, Officer Daniel Pantaleo, with whom uh, I went to junior high school with his sister. Okay, so this was a family matter. I'm from a neighborhood that's closer to Eric Garner's, but I went to middle school with someone from a very different part of the island, the sister of Daniel Pantaleo. So when the NYPD murders Eric Garner, I'm teaching at West Point, and I'm living this double life, and it, it just shows how the empire came home for me. Every day I would put on my Class B uniform, make sure it was starched, and, and teach American history to these cadets at the, the key pillar of American empire, right? West Point, you know? But then what I was doing secretly in the evenings is I was shedding, you know, I, I was shedding my uniform, putting on my Wu-Tang hoodie, and driving an hour and a half back to Staten Island to yell at the police and protest peacefully. <laughs> and then I'd wake up in the morning exhausted and do it all over again. It's been over weeks. And, and I realized, like, oh my God, like, what am I doing to myself? This dual life is going to kill me. And it helped me, you know, sort of move on to where I'm at today. Breezing through it, how else did it come home? Torture and waterboarding. Right? We saw that happen. I mean, the Spanish Inquisition used waterboarding. The, in the Philippines, our soldiers used waterboarding, and the Japanese waterboarded our pilots, and we hung the people who did that at the Nuremberg trials. But it was, you know, we were told it wasn't torture. Mass surveillance, we have a genuine hacker state. And somehow Edward Snowden is the enemy, and not the NSA that is looking at your phone every minute of every day. It's wild. That would not have happened without the empire. Okay, it's all connected. It's intersectional in a different sense, but it is intersectional. Illegal rendition, Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo. Do you know at Guantanamo right now, the military is hiring hospice care preemptively? Because the military knows the dirty secret. Those prisoners are going to die there. There is no plan to release them. Did, how many of us saw that story? Very few. More in this room than out there. We don't even know this is going on. The border, refugees, the militarization of the border, kids in cages, you know, they don't deserve to toothpaste or, or soap. I mean, an, an agent of the government argued that with a straight face. I mean, this is, this is wild. And the war on the press, the war on dissent, it's been there for a long time. But remember, it's not just Trump. Trump's taken it to another level, but Obama prosecuted more leakers under the Espionage Act than all the presidents combined, even though the Espionage Act is wildly wildly archaic. No one talks about that, right? Because he got a pass. He got a pass from most of the left, or at least most of the mainstream MSNBC Democrats who of late hate me very much. 
<laughs> Chelsea Manning got one of the stiffest sentences for a, a leaker in history, okay, but literally tortured, okay, like just treated horribly, most Americans barely noticed, put back in prison even after for refusing to uh, testify against Assange and WikiLeaks. The difference with Trump, though, is Trump is going directly after Assange. And Assange, like him or not, doesn't matter. Okay, this is about solidarity with the press. He is a publisher. That group, ultimately, whether you like WikiLeaks or not, it, he is a publication. Now, the Obama administration considered filing charges against Assange's his publication. But the thing is, that's never been done before. Okay, at least not in modern memory. Yes, we imprison leakers, but we usually leave the publishers alone. The difference is, Trump has charged uh, Assange on 17 counts under the Espionage Act, and then an 18th count on something else. This is massive, massively worrying. But MSNBC and CNN and the New York Times, they don't show a whole lot of solidarity with Assange, right? Just like they don't show a whole lot of solidarity with Max Blumenthal, right, the journalist who was recently imprisoned. Because what they don't realize is that eventually this system's gonna come for them too. See, they're, they're polite media, they're corporate media, so they think they're, they're untouchable, they're not. They are not. It reminds me of, you know, I'm gonna mess up the quote, the, the activist in Nazi Germany who said, you know, first they came for the socialists and I didn't pay attention because I wasn't a socialist, and then they came for the gays, but I wasn't gay, so I didn't pay attention. Then they came for the Jews, and well, I'm not Jewish, but then when they came for me, there was no one left to speak out. And that's how the media should feel about people like Assange. Finally, the empire came home for me personally, and, and I'm not trying to make it about me, but I want to, you know, share this because I think it probably matches with what a lot of people in this audience uh, felt when they left the military, felt even just as a protester and feeling like a pariah. Uh, I spent 27 months overseas. I mean, I, the amount of death and destruction I saw was, was uncanny. Um, I had a three-year-old when I was in Afghanistan. I, I didn't see him for a year. He, he cried when he met me at the airport because he didn't remember me. Um, I've had two failed marriages, serious PTSD to the extent of VA disability and inpatient treatment. I'm doing okay. But, you know, that's just one man. That's just one guy. But th this is broad. 22 veterans a day are killing themselves at higher rates than ever before, and three of them were my own. I mean, three of my soldiers killed themselves. I mean, 40% of the casualties that, or the, the fatalities under my command were suicides. And so why don't these wars stop? You know, I think there's a lot of reasons. And, the, and these are the five things we have to fight in my last, you know, two minutes here. Number one, I want you to think about this throughout the day, if you can. There's apathy and the, and the necessity of wage survival. Okay, the system is, is set up to put you in debt, so you don't, you don't have time for activism. I mean, we're doing this on a Saturday because a lot of us have to work, right? It's really hard to, like, run a movement on the weekends, and the government's counting on that apathy. The military industrial plus congressional, plus corporate media complex. The revolving door that lets St. Jim Mattis, who we were all told was such an adult in the room, leave the Defense Department and go back to the corporate industry working for, like, your Raytheon. I mean, it, it, it's, it's insane. And the current Defense Secretary was a lobbyist for Raytheon. Foreign influence lobbying, okay, were the three Bs, right? You know the three Bs. Mohammed bin Salman, right? Mo uh, Mohammed bin Zaif uh, of UAE, and then, of course, uh, Benjamin and Yahoo Bibi. The three Bs, I mean, they're actually influencing our government. There's the corporate mainstream media that tells you what's okay to think and what's not. We have Les Moonves of ABC saying Trump might be bad for America, but he's good for my bottom line. He said that out loud. It's almost refreshing, that kind of corruption, being out loud. <laughs> and I also think the lack of a draft. And Harvard's right over here. And did you know that in World War II, about 453 graduates of Harvard died in the Second World War, which is only 30 less than West Point. How many Harvard grads have died in the wars on terror? Yeah, zero. So what I say is that we have a culture, a war culture of pageantry over prudence. And we're going to see that again in the most vacuous uh, detail on Veterans Day. And check out some of my upcoming articles on that. So we'll, we'll kill at least 480,000 by a low estimate civilians. 7,000 of our soldiers died. 5.9 trillion in tax dollars. But somehow we can't afford Medicare for all, right guys? The best way to honor veterans, and you'll see this in my stories, is to create fewer of us yes. and to bring the troops home. <laughs> and, and, and in closing, I'm, I'm always reminded of, of my hero, uh, Eugene Debs, socialist candidate for president who ran from prison and got about a million votes. He said to the judge on the day of his sentencing, he said, um, 
Judge, I, I realized long ago that I'm no better than the meanest man among us. And, and I, I said then and I say now that as long as there is an underclass, I'm in it. As long as there is a criminal element, I am of it. And so long as there is a soul in prison, I am not free. That's intersectionality. That's grassroots activism. And that's what we need to remember. Thank you.